Thanks for streaming the Fox 54 Week in Review. I'm Kenesha Dees. From a whistle stop tour around the shoals to a magic carpet ride with the cast of the Aladdin stage show, here is North Alabama at its best from the week of February 24th through March 2nd. Now, another hot zip code on Unzipped, sponsored by Engel and Volkers. Chances are you've probably heard of the Quad Cities consisting of Florence, Tuscumbia, Sheffield, and Muzzle Shoals. This area, commonly called the Shoals, known for its music and American history. The Shoals is also a great place to live with four different cities. There's a little something for everyone there. Let's unzip the 35661 with our Nixon Norman. This month, we take things to the Shoals. This area is the Quad Cities, composing of Florence, Muscle Shoals, Tuscumbia, and Sheffield. And those four cities extend over two different counties. Florence is in Lauderdale County, and Tuscumbia, Sheffield, and Muscle Shoals are all located in Colbert County. Each one of these cities have their own personal flair, and we'll dive a bit into each. But just as I and England Volkers, Kara Mobley, started, we'll also begin in Tuscumbia, Alabama. The Shoals area has so much rich history, and Tuscumbia is great. Uh, Tuscumbia is home of Helen Keller, so Helen Keller birthplace, and also the Tennessee Valley Arts Museum, uh, so a lot of great art culture there. With Tuscumbia being the birthplace of Helen Keller, it's also the birthplace of the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind. With Keller being born in 1880, there's bound to be remnants of other old homes in Tuscumbia as well. And actually, what Mobley tells me about the homes here goes for all four of these cities. There are older homes, but also there is a lot of new construction happening there as well. With a mix of older and newer homes, there's a little bit of everything for everyone in the Shoals. And speaking of old to new, the city of Sheffield, like most of these historic cities, has an old time feel, but it's constantly changing and evolving. The Ritz Theater is a really great area in downtown Sheffield, and uh, they, they do seem to have an up and coming atmosphere. As we move things over to Muscle Shoals, there's one question that has always come to my mind, and that is, why is this place named Muscle Shoals? What I heard about Muscle Shoals was it was named that when people first came here, there were a lot of mussels, uh, the sea creature, on the banks of the river here, and so they named it Muscle Shoals, um, even though they spelled it muscle like on your arm, like your bicep muscle, but that's kind of, that's what I heard. Apparently, no one actually knows for sure how the city got its name, but there are a couple of theories out there. As Mobley mentioned, at one time, there may have been piles of mussels along the shoals of the Tennessee River. And another is that the shape of the river itself looks like a man's arm or muscle. Now that we've ventured through Colbert County, let's end things off in Lauderdale with Florence. It's a small city, but it's got a lot of great amenities for people living in the area. It's only an hour away from Huntsville. It's only two hours away from Nashville. Um, and for people who are interested in the arts, the community theater here is very vibrant. Not only has Florence been designated as a 2022 Tree City USA for the 36th consecutive year, it's also home to one of the few federal buildings in the nation that still combines a post office and a federal courthouse beneath one roof. Oh, I love the post office. It's a beautiful building uh, that, that it's kind of a, what, what would you call it? I was curious for both Mobley and myself. So I did some research and it seems to be some sort of Greek revival architecture. But that's not the only piece of history living in Florence. W.C. Handy, or the father of the blues, was also born in Florence. W.C. Handy is the father of the blues and he is from Florence. Uh, there is a museum here. His house is here, you can tour. Really making the Shoals a place of music, history, and music history. Love Month slowly comes to a close. McDonald's is giving you one last reason to say I'm loving it by offering 10 scholarships to local HBCU students. Our Jasmine Bird takes us to learn more about the moolah. Well, Kanisha, today I'm loving it. it takes on a whole new meaning much further beyond that tasty Big Mac everyone is used to. However, in honor of Black History Month, local McDonald's owner operators are 
awarding 10 scholarships to HBCU students. McDonald's owner operator Tim Wilson says time is ticking. Yeah, so there, there's five days left for you to be able to sign up for uh, the available scholarships. This is the second year they're offering the Trailblazer Scholarship and 10 students will be awarded $1,000 each. And for many people, the biggest obstacle for uh, continuing education they face is uh, the final financial aspect. So, you know, we're just, we're happy to help, uh, help the communities that we serve. And if you'd like to apply, eligible HBCUs include Tennessee State University, uh, Meharry Medical College, Fisk University, Austin P University, Alabama A&M University, Oakwood University, uh, American Baptist University in Nashville, and Drake State Community College. Wilson says all in all. As McDonald's owner operators, you know, we continuously search for ways to uh, provide uh, support to the communities that we do business in. And, you know, it's a great honor uh, for the greater Tennessee Valley to be able to provide the scholarship to students in need. For more information on how you can get your application in, head on over to our website at fox54.com. Valley's top teacher, sponsored by Calhoun Community College. After serving our country, this week's top teacher now serves in education. She's a special education behavioral analyst countywide in Jackson County, and people say she goes above and beyond for all students. Meet our Valley's top teacher, Candace Turner. For Jackson County School District, Candace Turner. Skyline High School is one of her more than dozen stops in the county and what she's rolling. Paper clips, computer, binders, I have everything in there. What she says is her office on wheels. Turner is a board certified behavioral analyst and became one in 2016. Working with students with disabilities is just it's like breathing to me. I, I just automatically do it. It comes really easy and I enjoy it. She served in education for 14 years after serving our country in the Navy. When I moved to this area, I started subbing and um, I subbed for this lady named Angie Kelly and she was my mentor kind of because she pushed me to go back to school. And special education just seemed like kind of a given, even though I'd never done it. Turner says she enjoys being an advocate for her kids because. I like the challenge and helping them be successful on their own, in their own areas, not successful as defined by the world, but successful as defined by them. And while she works with teachers and students, she works with parents too. The adults and <laughs> that I work with are more of a challenge sometimes because I don't always change the child, I change the environment, which includes the adults in it, and then the child changes. Turner encourages newcomers in special education to be a sponge and learn all you can. Ask 50 million questions of everybody that you can talk to. Well, she was such a joy to talk with. Congratulations, Mrs. Turner. Check out how Turner knew special education is her calling and when she was surprised as top teacher. All this on Fox54.com. And don't forget to know.
nonprofit continues to spread the love by meeting the needs of foster children. The Kids to Love Foundation broke ground on its new mental wellness center. Our Jasmine Bird takes us there. Well, today, I may just be on your child's favorite aisle. And what aisle am I talking about? The toy aisle. Children love toys, right? And today, I'm at the Kids to Love Foundation. And the Kids to Love Foundation continues to meet the needs of children in foster care. And today is no different because the Kids to Love Foundation is breaking ground on their new mental wellness center. Kids to Love Foundation founder and CEO Lee Marshall says mental health is a crisis in our community and no one feels that more than the children in foster care. Up to 80% of children in foster care have significant mental health issues. That's compared to approximately 18 to 22% of the general population. So today, this is the foundation's response. We are so excited. We are breaking ground today on the Smith Family Wellness Center, home of the Grand Hill Trauma Team. The foundation's team of therapists serving these kids and the community make up the Grant Hill Committee, named in memory of the late Alabama football player Grant Hill, who studied trauma and its impact. Hill was working towards his PhD in counseling when he lost his life in a hunting accident. Grant Hill's father, Brad Hill, says the Hill family partnering with the Kids to Love Foundation is a perfect partnership. And we are committed to helping the youth that have experienced trauma and tragedy in their lives. Marshall says this is an 11,000 square foot facility and they'll do more than treat trauma. But we will be able to help them heal from the trauma that foster care and the abuse that led them into care that they have experienced. In Madison, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Big changes headed to Pratt Avenue. The city of Huntsville approved of a streetscape improvement project in hopes of improving safety for pedestrians and drivers while calming traffic. We learn more about the project and what people think about it. As Huntsville continues to grow, residents are no stranger to new buildings and road construction. All that to say, the city announced the approval of a $1 million streetscape improvement project for Pratt Avenue, more specifically within the historic Five Points neighborhood. You know, it started really actually by constituents that lived in the area that brought to our attention the need to uh, continue the improved uh, aesthetics of Pratt Avenue because it does connect our five points all the way up to uh, Montesano, Bankhead Parkway. Kathy Martin, Director of City Engineering, says going through five points on Pratt Avenue, there's a landscaped island in the center between Russell and Grayson. But when you go from Grayson to Maysville, there's not any defined parallel parking spaces for all the residents in that area and the landscape median goes away. Grayson Street to Maysville Road will be seeing the improvements and from Russell to Grayson Streets, they'll be resurfacing the roads. This road is a major corridor within the downtown area. Martin's saying an estimated 10,000 vehicles drive through daily. So the city hopes this project will make it safer for pedestrians and drivers while slowing down traffic. A multimodal access, so for bike lanes to improve the sidewalks, to improve the parallel parking, and all this in an effort to, uh, you know, uh, create safety within the area, but as well as traffic calming, you know, landscape median, curb and gutter, things like that, will help slow the traffic down in that area. One Five Points resident who prefers to remain anonymous says the city has worked hard on this plan, but feels like the project will bring more traffic. They don't want to change Pratt Avenue. They want it to still be access to, to Bankhead Highway and the road is just not equipped to that, and this is a neighborhood. It's not an expressway. The project will be funded 80% federally and 20% locally, and the design on the project is 60% complete with work set to begin this fall. Sedona Meadows, Fox 54 News. From severe weather to public safety to financial security, the city of Madison wants to make sure you're covered. That's why they hosted their annual Community Preparedness Fair today, also known as ReadyFest. This is Ready Fest. It's an annual event that we have to help prepare the citizens for all kinds of things, from inclement weather, from natural disasters, um, also um, how to be proactive in protecting themselves and their family. The city of Madison wants you and your family to remain safe and secure during emergency situations. Here at Ready Fest, all ages are learning about the community resources available to them. 
I like the Moses, the dogs, and the candy. And although we all love dogs and candy, this event serves as a way for people to find out how to be prepared for the unexpected. We're in February, about to be in March, so we all know what that brings in North Alabama with severe weather. Ryan Gentry with Madison Fire and Rescue is educating the public on smoke detectors and how it's extremely important to not only check them during severe weather season, but throughout the year. We're making sure that we're checking those monthly, uh, replacing batteries if it's uh, appropriate every six months and then replacing any and all detectors after 10 years of life, no, no matter if they're still working or not. Carbon monoxide safety is also at the forefront of conversation from the fire department. Making sure that we're keeping generators 50 feet away from the homes, not burning them or running them inside the garage, uh, not using gas grills inside the garage with that carbon monoxide that can um, enter without us knowing it. It's being aware of whatever the threat is, whether it's weather, whether it's natural disaster, or if it's everyday life, things that they're going to face on the street. Investigator Teresa Taylor Duncan with the Madison City Police Department represents the free RAD program also known as the Rape Aggression Defense Course. It's basically a program that empowers young women and gives them self-confidence, the ability to recognize where there might be threats, things that, that as young women, they're not aware of. And we're talking about campus safety, we're talking about safety at home, safety at work. Investigator Taylor Duncan says the majority of the physical violence their department sees is domestic violence. So this program gives women the ability to protect themselves, to recognize recognize those trigger situations that they can be finding themselves in and to give them options to defend themselves and get themselves out of danger and out of harm's way. Ultimately, whatever the threat may be, the city of Madison hopes people walk away from ReadyFest feeling confident that they have the tools, resources, and knowledge to stay safe. February 24th marked one year since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Ukrainian support groups all across the country have been bearing their blue and yellow flags, singing patriotic songs, and banding together in support of Ukraine. There was a rally here today in Huntsville. Fox 54 was there. It's been a year of a full-scale invasion and genocide. Uh, made by Russia against Ukraine. Today, of course, that's a special event. It's anniversary. Anniversary is a bad word for that, but it is one year since we got hit by Russian Federation. The whole power of Russian Federation hit us, hit our homes. We lost our relatives. We lost everything we had. And all of we live here in the United States, we're still Ukrainian in our hearts. Russia! Although Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th of last year, many of those who spoke at today's rally said this isn't just a fight for Ukraine's freedom. This is a fight for freedom for all. This is not just a fight for Ukraine. This is a fight for freedom. It's a fight for democracy. It's a fight for everything that is good and right in this world. That was Alex Drukey and Andy Quinn. Two Alabama-based veterans who voluntarily decided to join Ukraine in the fight against Russia. During their time in Ukraine, the two became prisoners of war, tallying up over 100 days in captivity. The pair was brought back home in September of 2022. We firmly believe that one of the things that brought us home was all the people that contacted their elected officials and kept our names alive. Now it's our duty to keep Ukraine's name alive. That's exactly what he, Quinn, and everyone who attended today's rally and beyond want to do. Keep Ukraine's name alive. Ukraine is going to win this war. I guarantee you, if we give them the tools, they're going to win it. But God forbid if they don't, Putin's not going to be satisfied. And he's going to go for other countries. So we have to stop him here. We have to stop him now. The support, thoughts, and prayers for Ukraine are extremely appreciated. But in order to continue going face to face with Russia, Ukraine needs weapons. They need artillery, they need munitions, and they would love to have fighter jets. Artillery, 155 shells. Yes. <laughs> Fire jets would be great. Yeah. F-16s, anything. If you weren't able to show support at a rally this weekend, there is something you can do. As Drukey had mentioned earlier, placing a call to your local representative can have far more of an impact than you may think.
I urge everyone, contact your representatives, let them know that you support Ukraine. It does work. Um, Senator Shelton, no, I'm sorry, uh, Representative Adderholt said that he got around 14,000 phone calls just about me and Andy. It was the most phone calls he'd ever received on, on any issue. And we're home, so it works. So call your representatives, let them know that you want Ukraine to get the weapons they need so we can end this war. The numbers keep pouring in on the rate of homelessness in Huntsville. The North Alabama Coalition for the Homeless revealed at least 549 people are without a place to lay their head. Our Sedona Meadows is live in the studio. And Sedona, you, want to, you talk to one of our county commissioners who are addressing this homelessness. Yes, Kanisha. Commissioner Violet Edwards told me when a special project money came up, she felt it was the perfect opportunity for the commission to work together and provide funding to back three organizations who helped form a pathway for the homeless to become self-sufficient. District 6 has a large homeless population, and as rents continue to go up, we're seeing our homeless population is more present. We have all of the homeless shelters are in the district, more and more camps are popping up, and it's something that the county as a whole has decided to uh, pay some attention to. We are, we're putting some, some dollars behind it. $65,000 to be exact, and that's going to be split between New Futures Inc., Family Services, Lift Housing Program, and Habitat for Humanity of the River Valley three organizations that provide a pathway from homelessness to stable housing. We've given money to an emergency shelter that's usually the first point of entrance for the homeless, transitional housing, and then program that looks at renters or home ownership. Money toward all the phases someone homeless may have to go through before getting to a point of self-sufficiency. The final piece to this is home ownership, and that's where Habitat for Humanity comes in. We're the final piece of the puzzle for that long-term solution to uh, homelessness, substandard and poverty housing. We're getting people into safe and affordable homes. Jeremy Folks, who is the executive director of Habitat for Humanity of the River Valley, says there is a dire need for families to have an affordable place to live. Over one in eight families in Alabama are paying over half their gross income towards rent. So, and that number is probably even higher here in the Madison County area, Huntsville area. Seven out of 10 people live paycheck to paycheck, which means if they have any kind of issue, whether they lose their job or someone gets sick and they miss a paycheck, they find themselves behind on bills and they could possibly lose the roof over their head. Each organization will use the commission's donation differently. $25,000 being allocated to Habitat for Humanity of the River Valley, who will use it towards the building of a new home in North Huntsville for a single mother who is just an amazing lady, who's done outstanding work, who works hard, and she's just trying to provide a safe and a stable home for her family. And Commissioner Violet Edwards thanks all of the organizations for the work they do and says it's a great day when the county is able to back them, helping people in need. Sometimes choosing the right career can be challenging, but Athens Intermediate School is helping fourth and fifth graders make that decision a little easier by exposing them to all kinds of possible career paths. Our Jasmine Bird takes us to the classrooms for career day. Many of these careers, these students may have never heard of or never thought of. Says Athens Intermediate School counselor, Courtney Bell. So we have 17 different professions that have been represented from our community and around the area. Bell says this is a day for the kids to start thinking of what they want to do when they grow up. Right here in Huntsville, Alabama. And I'm not building rocket engines, I'm building the plant that builds the rocket engine. So really who's cool? The students were allowed to choose which um, people, which professions they would like to listen to and participate with. Gunnar Wilbanks is a fourth grader who says after today he's still deciding what he wants to be when he grows up, but he has a pretty good idea. But I want, I think I want to be some kind of engineer. He also learned what civil engineers do today. And they like told us there's more than like they do than just roads. They like design bridges. They have to work with the soil and the habitats. Sarah Carter is another fourth grader who says after today, she wants to become an aerospace engineer when she grows up. And this is what she learned about that. 
they have like this headquarters that where if something goes wrong they like speak to the astronauts and stuff. Bell believes this day is very important for the future of their students. I just think it's very important to start planting seeds now. In Athens, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. Yeah, um, I mean, Aladdin is uh, a spunky young fella, <laughs> just to say the least. Says Adi Roy, who plays Aladdin in the North American tour of Aladdin. Roy says his character Aladdin has a lot of problems in the play because he's poor and fighting for food. He's like basically surviving on nothing um, until he meets a genie and he kind of gets three wishes to make his whole dreams come true. Marcus M. Martin plays the genie in Disney's North American tour of Aladdin. Martin says his character is the life of the party. Um, and he comes and kind of turns Aladdin's world upside down um, and teaches him a few things along the way. Martin also shares his thoughts on being a part of the Disney legacy. It's a responsibility that I try to honor every night on stage. So. Sensu Amadi plays Princess Jasmine in Disney's North American tour of Aladdin. Amadi says one thing she's very excited about is being a part of a cast that is so diverse. And I think it's so important for people to um, see this show and see people of color telling this story because it's an important one. Amadi says Princess Jasmine is the only female lead in the entire show. And I think she's a great role model for younger girls and even for us now today. And just in case you are wondering, Martin says this show is for everybody. You know, bring the kids, bring the uncles, the aunties, cousins, grandpa, grandma, everybody. <laughs> in Huntsville, Jasmine Bird, Fox 54 News. That wraps up your Week in Review. I'm Kenesha Dees. Remember to check out fox54.com and download our mobile app for more of our stories. From everyone here at Fox 54 News, we'll see you next time.